So, good morning and welcome to our worship service today. I have a couple of announcements for you. First, I want to thank you, CEPC Church family, for your faithful, joyful, uh, generous, and sacrificial giving uh, th this past month, the month of April. I mean, thank you. And uh, please uh, keep, keep praying for God's provision for our church uh, during this time. Uh, but I am, I'm so encouraged by your faithful stewardship and your generosity, so thank you. The second announcement is that next Sunday we will recognize and honor our graduating high school seniors uh, during our virtual worship service. And so um, please plan to join us for that and to please be in prayer for these um, young women and young men who are graduating from high school and beginning to transition into whatever's next for them uh, in, in their lives. And now will you please um, allow me to formally welcome you to our worship service. To all who are weary and need rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To all who feel, fail and desire strength. To all who sin and need a savior. To all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And to whoever will come. This church opens wide her doors and offers her welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you please stand for our call to worship? Which is Psalm 105, verses 1 to 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us worship God together. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You made the heavens and earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Your invisible attributes, your eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen through what you have made. The heavens declare your glory. And so, Father, we praise you. We praise you this day for your providence. 
You are the governor and sustainer of all things. In you, all things hold together. In you, we live and move and have our being. You give to all life and breath and all things. You work all things after the counsel of your own will. You have numbered even the hairs upon our heads, and not even a sparrow falls from a tree apart from your will. We praise you, our God, for these, your great works of creation and providence. Above all, we praise you for redemption. There is no other God besides you. There's no other Savior. There's no other rock to whom the ends of the earth may turn and be saved. We rejoice that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world and gave your Spirit to abide with us and in us and teach us all things. May we have fellowship with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even as we pray the way Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We stand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and We have a responsive affirmation of faith this morning. It's Psalm 23, and so I will lead, and if, if you'll join in and follow, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes, he makes me, me lie, lie down, down in green pastures. pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores, restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for, for his, his name's sake. sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, I will fear, fear no evil, for you, you are, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, you prepare, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My, my cup, cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And, and I, I shall dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Once on a dreary mountain, we wandered far and wide. Far from the cleansing fountain, far from the piercing side. But Jesus saw and found us, and washed our guilt away. With cords of love, He bound us to be His own today. Redeemed, restored, forgiven. Dear Lord, receive the glory of each recovered soul. Oh, who can tell the story of love that made us whole? Not ours, not ours, the merit be yours alone, the praise. And ours, a thankful spirit to serve you all our days. Redeemed, restored, Lord.
seated. And as we're often reminded here in our worship service, when we come to our time of confession of sin, that God is holy, that we are not, and yet, no matter how deep our sin goes, the good news of the gospel is that the grace of God in Jesus Christ is greater than all our sin. And so please keep these thoughts in your minds, in your hearts, as we enter into this time of confession together. Now our call to confession this morning is James chapter 2, verse 10. James writes, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Let us confess our sins together. O Holy Father, because we are fallen, sinful creatures... It is so easy for us to think only of ourselves and ignore the needs of others. Our sinful natures lead us to selfishness and indifference. Thereby do we murder our brother and sister in our hearts and sin against you, our Father. O Lord, we do humbly confess our selfish nature and plead your forgiveness. Give us, we pray, the mind and heart of our Savior who loved the unlovely and redeemed us from destruction. Burden us with the souls of those who are perishing, that we may be bold to testify of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Use us, your people, to gather your elect from the four corners of this world so that your glory may cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's take a few moments now to confess our sins silently to our listening Lord. Hear now our assurance of pardon and comfort from Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear and receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Great God of highest hand, occupy my lonely heart. Hold it all and reign supreme, conquer everywhere, O God. Let no lies of sin remain that resist your I was blinded by my sin, had 
have no ears to hear your voice. Do not know your love within. Had no taste for heaven's joy. Then your spirit gave me life. Open up your word to me. Through the gospel of your son. Our God and Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving. We rejoice as we recall the goodness, mercy, and love you have for us. Even though the circumstances we experience may be trying and tempt us to despair, we choose to be thankful and express gratitude to you as we remember who you are and how much you have done for us. We are grateful for the work of Christ. He has revealed you to us, and without him, we would not know you. He has made us acceptable to you by fully paying for all our sins with his precious blood. We gain favor in your sight by being clothed in Christ's righteousness, so that when you look on us, you see his beauty instead of our unworthiness. He secured our place in your family and promised to prepare a place for us to be with you for all eternity. We are grateful that you are a firm foundation that cannot be moved. You are our stronghold and protector. You watch over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our heads apart from your will. You not only foresee things that will come to pass, but you plan them and cause them to happen in such a way that all things must work together for our salvation. We are grateful for how you have provided for us each day of our lives up to this very day when we reflect on all that we have seen in our lives, all the days that we have lived, and the provision for our daily needs we must give you thanks for we have nothing that has not come from you father as we consider the effects of these many weeks of social distancing have had on us we come to you in great need for many this season has stripped away the busyness of life that so easily distracts us We have been unable to ignore the harsh voice of introspection that has exposed things about ourselves we wish we could ignore. Social distancing has reduced the gospel fellowship that helps us battle the lies of the evil one. 
We are in deep need of your Holy Spirit that assures us of our acceptance with you because of Jesus' completed work. Give us the strength to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Lord, many have lost jobs during this time and many more will in days to come. Those still working are faced with extra responsibilities due to reduced workforce and also the stress of uncertainty about future employment. Help us to remember that it is you who gives us the ability to produce wealth. As we acknowledge that you are our help and provider, give us a confidence in you that drives out all fear and gives peace through the uncertainty that we face. God, as our nation and city begin to emerge from the shut-in, we ask that you give wisdom, enable leaders to make sound decisions, and help citizens to resume activities prudently. Protect us from a resurgence of the virus. Allow us to emerge from this season more confident in your providence and goodness. Fill us with your spirit and help us remember who you are and recall the evidence of your goodness in the past so that we may trust you through all that we face. Thank you for the work you are doing to mold us into the image of your son. Teach us to rejoice, to reject self-reliance and depend fully on you. Let our hearts and minds be held steadfast by your spirit as we look to you and wait for you. Glorify your name in our lives and through these difficult days. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we give to God his tithes and our offerings. Lord, from sorrows deep I call When my hope is shaken Torn and ruined from the fall Hear my desperation For so long I've fed and prayed God come to my rescue Even so the thorns remain Still my heart will praise you Storms within my troubled soul Questions without answers On my faith these billows roll God be now my shelter Why are you cast down my soul Hope in him who saves you When the fires have all grown this heart to praise you. Should my life be torn from me, every worldly pleasure. All I possess is grief. God be then my treasure. Be my vision in the night. Be my hope and refuge. Till my faith is turned to sight. Lord, my heart will praise you. Oh, my soul. You're still my God, my salvation. And oh, my soul, put your hope in God. My help, my rock, I will praise Him. 
stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him our loving heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, join me in prayer. First Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 to 19. The Apostle Paul writes, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Father, we, we acknowledge that there is there's a direct connection, a, a relationship between where we, where our, what our hearts are trusting in, and, our, and the way we think about our wealth. What our hearts are hoping in and the way we think about our wealth. And so, Father, please help us. Help us to heed the charge, the, the warning that Paul sets out here to not set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And may, Father, we, we, we take hold of that which is truly life. As we just sang, O oh my soul, put your hope in God, my help, my rock, I will praise him. Sing, O oh sing, through the raging storm, you are still my God, my salvation. God, you are our hope and not our riches in this present life. This is one of the many reasons why we bring our tithes and offerings as an act of worship in response to your mercy and grace, in response to your salvation, in response to your, your gospel work in our lives. Please receive these resources, bless them, multiply them, use them to support the, the ministry of this church, the, the preaching of your word. Use them to make disciples of all nations and use them to help us care well for the poor among us. And we pray you would do this for your kingdom glory, and for our ultimate good. And Father, as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth, we acknowledge that we, we need you. We need you to do in us and to us and even through us what we cannot do ourselves. Father, please, remove our distractions. We know there are many. You know there are so many. Remove them. Do not let them rob the next few minutes that we have during this service. Speak to us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're looking at John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. And uh, the context is still the same. Jesus is with his 11 disciples on the night before the cross. And last week, if you were with us, we looked at John chapter 15, verses 17 to 25. And in that passage, Jesus gave us some very hard news. 
He gave us some very hard and, and bad news. Specifically, we saw that, the hard news in John 15, verses 18 and 19, where Jesus says, If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And we spent a lot of time last week making the point that it, it's undeniable that the world hates and opposes and persecutes Jesus and his word and, and his faithful followers. But it's also undeniable that God loves this same world. But we read in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In our passage today, Jesus gives us some very significant and good news. Good news about the Holy Spirit. Significant and good news about the Holy Spirit's ministry to us and through us to the world. So put another way, God sends us followers of Christ out into the world, which he loves, to be witnesses as we seek to make disciples. So this is continuing this, this topic of the Christian and the world. And so last week we saw how hard it can be and the opposition that we face. And here in these two verses, Jesus makes it clear that we have a helper and that he will bear witness and that we are called to bear witness. And so here now, God's holy, inerrant, infallible, authoritative, sufficient, life-giving word, which is the words of Christ in John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning." This is the word of the Lord. And it's absolutely true, and it's given to us in love for our good. And as I've already alluded to, we're going to have three headings this morning. And all three of these headings are phrases that come from these two verses. So the first is, when the helper comes. Second, the heading is, he will bear witness. And then lastly, you also will bear witness. And so these three headings really are the summary of, of these two verses. So first, when the helper comes, look with me at verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So there's mention of this helper. Who is the helper? Well, the helper is the promised Holy Spirit. And we've already seen from earlier in John's gospel, John chapter 14, specifically this word helper used. And we've already discussed how various translations will use different words for helper. Sometimes it's helper. Sometimes it's comforter. Sometimes it's advocate. Sometimes it's paraclete. But the Greek word that's translated helper is the Greek word parakletos. And parakletos gives us the, the transliterated English word paraclete. Right, the prefix para means alongside of or beside, and the verb kletos means to call. So the helper, the paraclete, was someone who was called to come alongside you, to come alongside you, to, to help you in your defense. Right? The comforter, the advocate, to come alongside you, to help you in your defense, to, to comfort you, to strengthen you. But the Holy Spirit is the helper, and he's sent by Jesus from God the Father to come alongside to help, to comfort, to strengthen the followers of Christ. You know, Pastor Richard Phillips says the Spirit is the divine person who was called to our side to continue the ministry that Jesus began. There at our side, the Spirit calls out to help, calls out to us in the words of Puritan John Owen to support, cherish, relieve, and comfort the church. And don't we need all of that? Don't we need to be supported and cherished and relieved? Don't we need the comfort that only the Holy Spirit can give us? I mean, don't, don't forget what Jesus just finished telling his disciples. Remember John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. See, so he says the world is going to oppose you. And that's why I'm sending you the, the Holy Spirit to help her, the, the comforter, the advocate, the paraclete to come alongside you, to encourage you, to sustain you, to lead and guide you, to comfort you, to, to strengthen you. 
It's because the world, the world hates you. The world hates you on account of my name. As we said last week, the, the world is identifying the, the domineering, controlling, deceitful, and aggressively polemical mindset of unbelieving mankind. It's, it's the world system and the individuals who are living in settled opposition to and rebellion against Jesus. And this includes what they celebrate, what they reward, what they promote, what they sanction. This includes the world's ideologies, value commitments, expectations, and practices, all of which are in opposition to and rebellion against Jesus and his word and, and his followers. And we saw last week that if you are committed to faithfully following Jesus today, then in one way or another, you will be hated, persecuted, ostracized, marginalized, misrepresented, opposed, excluded in some form or fashion. If you refuse to compromise with the world and you live out, out of step with the world and instead you embrace the biblical view of truth, morality, sex, gender, marriage, the sanctity of human life, the exclusivity of salvation through faith in Jesus alone, then many Houstonians, even many Houstonians will think that you're bigoted. You're anti-science, you're anti-intellectual, you're, you're anti-woman, you're anti-gay, you're anti-Muslim, and, and the list goes on and on and on. However, the very significant news, the wonderful news that Jesus gives us in John 15, verses 26 and 27, is that you will never ever have to stand against the world's opposition alone. That the world will oppose us on account of Christ if we seek to be faithful to him, but we never ever stand alone. It's never ever you versus the world. It's never ever just you versus the world. That God the Father and God the Son have sent God the Holy Spirit to be with you and to dwell within you, to come alongside you, to, to help you, to comfort you, to guide you, to, to lead you, to strengthen you as you live for Christ in this world. You see, and this is more than enough. This is more than enough to get us through this life. This is enough. This is enough to sustain us. Jesus has provided for us with his spirit and with his word and with his church. Listen to how John, what John Calvin says about verse 26. He says, Jesus essentially said, True, the world will rage against you. Some will mock and others will curse your doctrine, but none of their attacks will be so violent as to shake the firmness of your faith when the Holy Spirit shall have been given to you to establish you by his testimony. And indeed, when the world rages on all sides, our only protection is that the truth of God sealed by the Holy Spirit on our hearts for if it were subject to the opinions of men, our faith would be overwhelmed a hundred times a day. But it's not subject to the opinions of men, that we're not left to stand against the world all alone. We're not left in that way. Hear again what Jesus says in John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, he's coming, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The helper is coming. But what will he do? What is the helper sent to do? This is our second heading. Simply put, he will bear witness. He will bear witness. Notice in verse 26, the Holy Spirit is not only called the helper, but he's also called the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of truth. And as the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit bears witness to the truth. He bears witness to the truth about Jesus. Do you see that? see that at the end of verse 26? That he, the promised Holy Spirit, will bear witness about me, is what Jesus says. That that's, that that's his role. That's his task. R.C. Sproul says it's the task of the Holy Spirit who is sent by the Father and the Son to apply the work of Christ to our lives. The Spirit never brings attention to himself, but always drives attention to Christ and to his accomplishment. See, the, the best illustration I've heard to describe one role of the Holy Spirit in bearing witness about Jesus is that of a floodlight outside of a, of a beautiful, striking building. So, like, for example, when I'm driving down the street at night, 
And, and, and I happen to look over and I see, you know, once again, a, a beautiful home or church or other building that's just lit up. I've never once said to myself, Richard, that's an incredible floodlight. I need to go find out, okay, which company makes those kinds of floodlights? No, I, I notice the building. I say to myself, you know, wow, that's a beautiful home. Or wow, look at, that's a pretty incredible, that's a pretty incredible church. Or, or, or I wonder what that structure is. I notice the building. And that's exactly what the floodlight is supposed to do. And the work of the third person of the Holy Trinity, the promised Holy Spirit, shines brightly as he bears witness about Jesus. And this was true for the disciples who had become the apostles 2,000 years ago, and it's true for Christians today. But let's think for a moment about the Holy Spirit's witness to and through the apostles. And so look at verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. As Jesus has already said in the previous passage, the apostles would be hated, persecuted, opposed by the world. Yet, yet, the Holy Spirit would dwell within them. They would be opposed, and yet, the Holy Spirit would bear witness to the truth about the person and work of Jesus to them. That they would be, they would be opposed, and they would be oppressed, and they would be persecuted, and yet, the Holy Spirit would establish the truth of Christ in and through them, on the pages of what we today call the New Testament. That the apostles would later write the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit would cause the apostles to remember and understand all the things that Jesus had taught them during his earthly ministry. And the Holy Spirit would teach them and, and clarify the doctrine that the apostles would then pass down to us in the Holy Scriptures. This is what the apostle Peter was writing about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit established the truth of Christ in and through the apostles on the pages of the New Testament. And then when the promised Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Guess what? We see the apostles are then, they're, there, they're empowered and they're emboldened to bear witness for Christ, to proclaim Jesus. And that's exactly what we see in the apostle Peter in the very first spirit-filled New Testament sermon. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches Christ. Peter preaches the, the life and ministry of Jesus. He preaches the, the death of Jesus. He preaches the resurrection of Jesus. He preaches the exaltation of Jesus. All in this one sermon, he preaches Christ. And then we see at the end of that sermon, Acts chapter 2, verse 40, it says, And with many other words, he bore witness about Jesus and continued to exhort them. You see, faithful Christian witness, it includes this proclamation of who Jesus is. And what he has done to save sinners like us. It includes, but it doesn't stop at living a godly life. That we must use our words. We're going to come back to this. But the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, would also bear witness to the souls of the apostles about the, the person and work of Christ when they would all suffer for their faith in Jesus as they lived godly lives and they ministered faithfully to others. Remember, I mean, the apostles, they were hated by the world. Jesus told them what would happen, and that's what happened. Right? Ten of these eleven would be executed for their faith in Christ and their faithful ministry, their faithful bearing of witness to others. They'd be executed as martyrs. And then the eleventh, the apostle John would spend the rest of his life exiled on a prison island for being a faithful follower of Christ. Well, what sustained them throughout their lives and their ministries? Well, the answer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as he bore witness by and with the word of God to their hearts. And guess what? The same is true for you, dear Christian, today. Like you have the same Holy Spirit dwelling within you empowering you, sustaining you, comforting you, leading you, guiding you, the same Holy Spirit. God the Father and God the Son have sent God the Holy Spirit to be with you and dwell within you as he bears witness to the truth 
about Jesus and his word to help you, to comfort you, to guide you, to strengthen you as you live for Christ in this world. And our Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 5, reminds us of this. It says, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of the Bible is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. See, never forget the, 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 the connection between the Holy Spirit, also called the Spirit of Truth, and the Word of Truth, our Bibles. There's a connection there. And as I've said to you many times, that there's, there's nothing more powerful in, in a local church than the Spirit of God moving and working through the Word of God in the hearts of the people of God. So in our passage today, Jesus essentially says that I know the world opposes you. Right? It opposed me, and it's going to oppose you. It oppose, if it opposes you, don't worry, it first opposes me. It first opposed me, and so it will oppose you on account of my name. However, I'm not going to leave you helpless and all alone, that I am praying to the Father, and he will send you one who comes with strength and power to help you when you face opposition, persecution, and exclusion on account of my name in this cruel world, that the Holy Spirit will help you Stand firm by the power of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. No matter how, how much the world opposes you, I will never leave you or forsake you. Even in the middle of a global pandemic, okay, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will provide for you. And so we see the first heading, when the helper comes. And thank God that he came. Second the heading, he will bear witness. And thank God for his witness. But then look at the third heading. You also will bear witness. And so look at verse 27. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So as the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit bears true witness about Jesus, the Holy Spirit also empowers Jesus' disciples then, 2,000 years ago, and today with us to bear witness about Jesus to the world, which operates in hostility, hatred, rebellion, and opposition to Jesus, his word, and his faithful followers. As I've said before, it's undeniable that the world hates Jesus, his word, and his faithful followers. But it's also undeniable that God loves the world. Therefore, followers of Jesus are sent out into the world to bear witness to Jesus before our friends and family members. But now look carefully at verse 27, especially there the second half of it. Because you have been with me from the beginning, it's clear that verse 27 has a unique message for the original audience, which was Jesus' disciples who would become the apostles. They had been with Jesus from the very beginning. They were able to offer eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts of all that Jesus had said and done during his earthly ministry. And they did that. They did bear witness to Christ. However, I don't want us to miss what verse 27 says to us, our witness for Christ today. So look carefully at 26 and 27. Do you see the connection in these two verses between our witness for Christ to others and the work of the Holy Spirit in us? See, the Holy Spirit first bears witness to our hearts about Christ. We are then compelled to bear witness about Christ to our friends and family, all the while trusting that the Holy Spirit must move and work through the word of God in their hearts, knowing that this must be a work of God through the power of the Holy Spirit if we are to effectively bear witness to our friends and family members and our neighbors. See, verse 27 Jesus says, and you also will bear witness. And then, many of us know, we know the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28. But in Acts chapter 1, there's another version of the Great Commission. Acts 1, verse 8. Some of the last words that Jesus says to these disciples before he ascends back to God the Father's right hand in heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit will come. So this is just before Jesus leaves them. This is just before he sends the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in Acts 1 verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there was a uniqueness to the witnessing of the apostles in the first century. But the Holy Spirit continues 
to empower us and embolden us and use our witness for Christ in the lives of others today as we still seek to make disciples of all nations. So putting together last week with this week, yes, the world, it's a hard place. It it hates, opposes, rebels against Jesus and his word and his faithful followers. But our response is not to hate the world back. That our response is also not to attempt to hide from the world as if we could possibly do that. Our response is to move out in the world in faith and love and in the power of the Holy Spirit to bear witness to Jesus before this same world, before our friends and our family members and our neighbors. We are to share the gospel with them. And I know this can be a very intimidating thing. It can be a a very intimidating thing for various reasons, depending on our personality. But I can think of two reasons that make it very intimidating. First, it can be intimidating because we fear rejection. And guess what? That, That might happen. In fact, if we bear witness to Jesus with a lot of people, it's guaranteed to happen. It's guaranteed to happen that we we will face rejection. It's bound to happen. No matter how winsome and thoughtful and loving that we attempt to be, that we are going to be rejected. People will reject Christ and his word and us because we're bearing witness to it. However, the opposite is also true. That whenever we step out in faith and we bear witness to Christ, that it's possible that God will move and work through the Spirit using his word to, to open eyes, to unstop ears, to change hearts, to save people. It's not just that people always reject. Sometimes people like us believe the gospel and we're saved. Second, it can be intimidating because we fear that we are ill-equipped. But that's not true. It's not true. You know the gospel. If you've been around our church for any length of time, you've sat through our services, our sermons, our classes, our our city groups. You've been on our retreats. You, You know the gospel. You know what Jesus did for you in his life, death, and resurrection. And and you know enough to bear witness. You know enough to point people to this Christ and to his word. So so how do we do do this? I know it can be intimidating, but what are some practical ways for us to, to move towards bearing witness to our family members and our friends. And so I've got several things for us to consider. And, and so some of these build upon the others, but I think they're all worth considering just the same. Here's the first one. We must never lose sight of the fact that true Christian witness is always a witness to Jesus Christ. See, true Christian witness is always a witness to Jesus Christ. Now, when you hear that, you may think that that all of your friends know about Jesus already. But do they really? Do they really know about the real biblical Jesus? I'm sure they've heard the name of Jesus, but do, do they know the Jesus that we find on the pages of the Bible? See, a witness about Christ is pointing people with our words to Christ. See, just as Peter preached Christ in Acts 2 in that first spirit-filled New Testament sermon, we must tell our family and friends all about Christ, about his life, his death, his resurrection. We must tell them, we can't assume they know, we must tell them about Jesus and his sinless, perfect life. We must tell them about his, his righteous life, how he has the righteousness that we lack in and of ourselves, the righteousness that we need. We must tell them that whenever we, we, we put our faith and trust in Christ, that he gives us his righteousness, that he clothes us in righteousness. You know, we, we prayed earlier along with our elder Jason Walker, thanking God for, for Christ's righteousness. We must tell them about that's where they must go to put faith in Christ so that he will then clothe them with his righteousness. We must tell them about Jesus' death, his, his substitutionary, atoning, sacrificial death on the cross in our place to bear the full guilt of our sin, to pay for it in full, to wipe it out, to to wash it away with his blood, to remove it as far from us as the east is from the west. We must tell them about this. We must tell them about his resurrection that proves all of this is true. We must tell them about his resurrection. That means that there's hope for them as there has been hope for us, that there's hope of a new birth. There's resurrection power of a new life of blind eyes being opened, of new hearts, of being new creations. 
So we must share the gospel. It's, it's not, only, not only is it true that the Holy Spirit first bears witness to our hearts about Christ, and we are then compelled to bear witness about Christ to our friends and family, but we also must never forget that we're utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit to do the saving. That we're utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit to open the spiritually blind eyes, to, to unstop the spiritually deaf ears, to, to soften the spiritually hard hearts. Never forget this. See, we're called to be faithful and to tell people about Jesus, but God must do the work of saving them. That we're called to plant the seeds of the gospel, but God must make the gospel seeds grow in a person's life. Now, the people in our lives, in our relationships, in our spheres of influence that we may think that we need to move out towards and to bear witness to them, they're going to be in different places in their respective spiritual journeys. And our friendships with them, our relationships with them will also be at different places. And for some of us, the relationship, it's ready for us to sit down with them or perhaps in these days to pick up the phone with them and to share the gospel with them, to tell them about Christ. However, sometimes the relationship and the friendship is just not quite there yet. And so don't let that discourage you. And if it's not quite there yet, what do you do? Well, you pray. You pray for God to, to move in the lives of your family and friends. You pray for God to, to, to give you opportunities to point people to Jesus and to his word. We begin to pray for the people in our lives. See, my guess is that the vast majority of us, we do not need to meet any new people in order for us to have a long list of people that we can be praying for. The people we can be praying for God to give us opportunities to share the gospel with them, to point them to Christ and his word. So, and as we're doing that, as we're praying for these relationships to develop, something else we can do is that we can let others know of our Christian faith in natural and casual ways. Natural and casual ways by mentioning that we go to church, that we attend a city group, a Bible study, we have a prayer group, that we support missionaries, we've been on a short-term mission trip, that our kids are going on a mission trip, that we participate in service projects. So you may not realize how little other Houstonians, our neighbors, actually know and think about Christianity and church these days. And so as you mention your Christian faith and your church involvement, that may be just what God uses to pique their interest. It wasn't that long ago whenever, um, I th this is exactly how a friend of mine came to know Christ. And so I, I'm, we're going to call him Mark. That's not his name. We'll just call him Mark. And Mark was friends with a member of CEPC. And so the member of CEPC was a Christian. Mark didn't, he never really talked much with that, that, that friend about Christianity before, but one night, one Saturday night, they were out together, and Mark noticed his friend kept looking at his watch. He kept looking at his watch, and so Mark said, what is it with the watch? I mean, you have somewhere to go. He said, well, I've actually, I've, I'm about to have to leave pretty soon. He said, why? He said, well, it's getting late. Mark said, no, it's not getting late. It's not late at all. What do you mean? He said, well, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian, and, and, and I'm going to church tomorrow, and I don't want to be sleepy, and I don't want to be late, and so I need to go. And so instead of Mark saying, okay, well, fine, see you later, you know what Mark said to him? He said, well, you know, I haven't been to church in a long time. I haven't even thought about church in a long time, but can I go with you? And the friend said, well, well yeah, I mean, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I mean, I like you, you're my friend, and this obviously seems like it's very important to you. This is significant to you. This must be a big part of your life in order for you to you know, stop the fun we're having now to get ready for this. And so if, if, it's, if it's that good, if it's that worth it, then I, I would like to come and I'd like to check it out. You see, we, we have no idea how mentioning to someone basic, ordinary Christian discipleship involvement in the church could possibly pique their interest and lead to further spiritual questions. We have no idea. We have no idea. The next time someone asks you, well, what did you do this weekend? Don't just say, well, nothing. Say, well, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing much. I, I just went to church and just kind of hung out around the house. If someone asks you what you did this past week. Don't just say, well, nothing much. Say, well, nothing much, but I you know, I participate in, in, in a Bible study, in a prayer group, or I, you know, I'm really trying to, you know, read through this 
book of the Bible these days. Just mention these things in normal, normal conversation. You have no idea how, how God may take one of the, that little comment. And that's what's used to trigger this person's investigation into Christ. Also, as you're doing all of this, ask questions. Ask questions and listen. Listen to other people's beliefs and experiences with faith and religion and church. Listen well. Listen sympathetically and listen to their challenges and their experiences. And, and then, as you can, offer to pray for them. Offer to pray for them and then surprise them by actually praying for them. And then, a few days later or a week or two later, follow back up with them. And let them know that you've been praying for them and ask if they've seen any changes if, or if they want to talk about how you've been praying for them. Also, you'll look for opportunity to share a, a difficult personal issue and, and simply mention about how your faith helped you to get through it. So our, our weaknesses, our fears, our uncertainties, our failures even can become our point of contact with others. And our openness and our vulnerability causes people to open up to us in return. And I think we all have a long list of people right now who are facing difficulty, who are facing challenges and uncertainties and anxiety. And so just take a step of faith, bathe in prayer, and open up to them. And as you're doing all of this, know that you can always share your personal story with them. You can always share your personal testimony of coming to faith in Christ. Author Becky Pippert says this, that therefore our task in witnessing and evangelism is to tell his story, Jesus' story, and our story in the hope that it may one day be their story. See, it's our task to tell his story and our story in the hope that it may one day be their story. And it doesn't matter if you think your personal story um, of coming to faith in Christ is exciting enough or compelling enough. That doesn't really matter. See, God does not only use exciting personal testimonies and stories to save others. In fact, I'll you, let you in on this little secret, that it, it's never our story that saves someone, right? No, no, no matter how great that you think your story is, it's not our story that saves someone, that our story is meant to point others to Jesus and to his story and to his word. And so know that God uses ordinary, boring testimonies in the lives of other people, especially with our ordinary stories point people to Jesus and his word. Right? Our testimony, it's not what saves others. It's also, it's not our life. You know, our godly lives and our testimonies of coming to faith in Christ are used in our witness, in our verbal witness as we point people to Christ and his word. Now, there are two more things I want to mention, and both of these, I think, in many ways are so obvious. They're so practical. But I think they may even be the most overlooked things. As we're praying for people and we're looking for opportunities to witness to them, we can invite them to join us in reading the Bible. We can invite people to read the Bible with us. Most of the people in our networks of relationships, they haven't read the Bible. They don't know what it says. And that no one has probably ever invited them to read the Bible. And I think if you begin to invite people to read the Bible with you, that you'll be utterly amazed at how many people agree to do it. In fact, at the beginning of April, uh, I got an email from one of our church members. And, and they told me, that they had an idea during the quarantine that they were going to invite their unbelieving siblings and their spouses to, to join them in reading uh, the Bible during the month of April. They were going to read one chapter out of the book of Proverbs every day throughout the month of, of April. And so they, they were really nervous about this, and they prayed about it. They felt led to do this, and so they stepped out. They invited all their siblings and their spouses to join them in this, and guess what? Every one of them said yes. Every sibling and every one of their spouses said yes, we'll join in. And guess what? It gets even better that one of the siblings said, hey, is it okay with you if I invite some of my other friends to join in on this too? Right? Can you believe that? I mean, that's, you know, that, that, it's just amazing that that happened. But do you know why that happened? You know, yes, the Spirit moved and worked, but it was because this church member prayed. And they stepped out in faith. They took the initiative, and they sent the invitation, and their siblings responded with yes. 
Now, the last practical aspect of bearing witness, which I'm going to mention today, is probably the most overlooked one. And that is, we bear witness to Christ today when we invite friends to come to church. When we invite friends to come to church with us. When we invite them to, to, to participate in our virtual worship service in these days with us. It wasn't that long ago when there was a study done of, of the city of Houston, specifically zip codes immediately around our church. And unchurched Houstonians were asked the question. So unchurched were asked, what would be the most effective thing, what would be most, what would be most effective in getting you to show back up in church? You haven't been there a long time, you're unchurched, as you say. What would be most effective in getting you to visit a church? And the overwhelming answer was a personal invitation from a friend. The personal invitation. That we have no idea how just simply praying for someone and taking a little step towards them, extending an invitation, will, will, will open the door for them to step through it and begin to investigate who this Jesus really is. And so you may be thinking, but Richard, this still sounds intimidating, and, and I understand but you do, you know enough to share the gospel of God's grace with your friends and family members. You really do. And the Holy Spirit will guide you and sustain you as you step out in faith to do this. You know, many of you, uh, you've heard my testimony, you've heard my story. If you remember one of the details of it, that the person who led me to faith in Christ, who pointed me to Jesus and his word, was another college student. Now, I don't want to say anything negative about college students, but he was a college student. Okay, he wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a college pastor. This was not a seminary trained, you know, grown up. This was a college student and God used him to lead me to Christ. That you know enough and you can do this. As the pastor Jack Miller once put it, evangelism is one hungry beggar eagerly eating the bread of the gospel and being changed by it. And then telling the other poor beggars to eat of the same bread. See, just, just as the floodlight illuminates and makes the home in our neighborhoods shine beautifully at night, brilliantly at night, the Holy Spirit illuminates Jesus and allows us to see him for who he is, our Savior, the Savior of sinners. And when we see Jesus clearly for who he really is, and we see what Jesus did for us with his life, death, and resurrection, then we, we will absolutely have to tell other people about him. We have to point other people to this Jesus. This Jesus we read about on the pages of the Bible, who is now risen and ascended to the right hand of God the Father in heaven, that we have to tell people about this gospel of God's grace. We have to, have to direct them to cry out to God in prayer, to, to acknowledge their sin, to confess it, to, to repent of it, and to trust in Christ, to, to plead with God the Father that they know that Jesus is the one and only Savior for sinners, that it's through his shed blood on the cross that they can be washed clean, that they can be forgiven. And here's the thing, if anyone, anyone, anyone in your sphere of influence, anyone of your family members, friends, neighbors, coworkers, who, who, who ask God to forgive them with a, heart, with a heartfelt prayer of faith, guess what? God will do it. God will save them. God will forgive them. See, we believe that it's possible for Jesus to save any person in our network of relationships. We believe this. He can do that. That no one is a lost cause. No one is too far gone. See, there's no heart that's too hard for Jesus to melt. And we know this because he saved us. Which means that he can save anyone. As I've been saying, it's, it is undeniable that the world hates Jesus and his word and his faithful followers. But it's also undeniable that God loves the world. And he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How can people like us, as frail and weak as we are, how can people like us bear witness to Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us, in John 15, 26 and 27. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the gift of the helper, the Spirit of truth, 
the promised Holy Spirit. We're so thankful for the internal and subjective witness that he bears to our hearts to, to strengthen us and to, to sustain us. And we're so thankful for the Holy Spirit's enabling and emboldening you know, power for us to, to bear witness to those around us in the world. God, please, impress upon our hearts and our minds, you know, beginning just with three, three, three people, three people that we're going to begin to pray for. Three people we're going to begin to, to beg you, Father, to open opportunities for us to begin to point them to Jesus and his word, sharing the gospel with them, sharing our testimony of coming to faith with them, inviting them to dialogue more with us, to read your word, to participate in the church services together and then discuss it. God, please, we pray you would use your spirit in your word to strengthen our hearts and to compel us to step out in faith in mission, all the while being humbly reliant upon you and the Holy Spirit to save sinners like us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?
Lift your heads and receive the Lord's benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, God's people, today and forevermore. Amen.